Welcome back to Court TV Live. We are going to shift gears to Brooklyn, New York, where day three of testimony in the R. Kelly sex abuse trial is underway. Kelly is facing human trafficking and racketeering charges amid allegations that he sexually abused six women, three of whom were minors at the time, over a period of 30 years. If he is convicted, R. Kelly could spend the rest of his life in prison. Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae has been in the courtroom this morning and joins me now from outside the federal courthouse in Brooklyn, New York. Good afternoon, Julia. Thank you for joining us. Get us up to speed on what has happened on the day in court. Good afternoon, Chanley. The defense attorneys for the defendant have already left the courtroom. They just walked past me, uh, but we're in a lunch break right now. So we've only heard from one witness of the day, and that's Anthony Navarro. He's an employee of Robert Kelly. He was inside that mansion in Olympia Fields, Illinois, back in early 2000, 2008. He worked for him when he was around 20 to 21 years old and says he didn't see any underage girls in the house, but he did confirm that he knows there were rules that the female guests had to follow when they were there and while they were guests of the defendant. That's something that the prosecution really wants to highlight what was going on in that house and how the enterprise was involved in making it all happen. Interesting. Now, is he still on the stand at lunch break or is he off the stand? What, what's the, I guess, where did they leave off right before lunch? It, it seemed that they are done with him for now. They are going to be calling, we're hearing around the courthouse that they are going to be calling witnesses that have to do with um, Aaliyah and the Jane Doe number one that we learned on the first day of this trial, the marriage that she entered into with the defendant back in 1994. So that's what we're anticipating coming out of court after the lunch break. That makes sense. Let's talk about Dr. McGrath, a witness from yesterday testifying. This is R. Kelly's doctor. Talk about the key highlights there, the issue of when R. Kelly was treated first for herpes. Chanley, Dr. McGrath was a really interesting character of a witness. He was someone who had treated the defendant for uh, since 1994, so a very long period of time. He's someone who did not receive any money for his medical services, but he said that he frequently was a social guest of Kelly. He went to concerts and parties and even was there for a party in the months before his arrest. But what he confirmed that the prosecution wanted to get out is that the defendant knew he he had herpes, that he received medical treatment for that herpes, and that he uh, was informed by his doctor to inform his guests, or rather his, his uh, partners, that he was positive, that he uh, could infect them, and that they needed to take steps as well. He even said that he uh, went to this, or he called in the prescription for Valtrex to treat that herpes. It's a Walgreens that was across from what was known as a rock and roll McDonald's. And that Walgreens, he said he called in prescriptions so often that he had the number memorized. So very repeated that he was giving this prescription to his friend clearly, but also his patient, Robert Kelly. Wow. And now, for our viewers, remind them why this is an important issue in the case about what sexually transmitted diseases R. Kelly had and why it's part of the allegations in the case. Right, we're going to hear about it a lot because it's part of the Man Act violations and the racketeering violations in this case because what the prosecutors are alleging is that he violated New York public health law. So that's really what connects this case to New York, things that happened here. So here's a look at that law that's a... Uh, local rule, state rule here, we're in federal court, but they do identify this rule that any person who knowing himself or herself to be infected with an infectious venereal disease has sexual intercourse with another shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. Now, the word venereal is the one that's really important and is disputed inside that courtroom because the defense says that herpes is not a bacterial type of venereal disease and they don't believe that it falls underneath this type of law. So they think that it should not even be a charge. So we heard a lot of questions on cross about what kind of strain this was, whether the doctor did any blood tests to determine this was herpes and whether there are different kinds. So that was what the defense was able to get out and also asking about the date because we know Jane Doe number four said that she 
uh, contracted herpes in 2009, 2010 from the defendant. But the doctor on the stand said he knows for sure that he prescribed it in 2011, but it was in the medical records for earlier than that. Interesting, and that is a big point of contention even on Jane Doe number four's testimony, right? And I'm and I'm hearing that there maybe were, were some exhibits introduced concerning her today. Well, there were exhibits that were actually introduced yesterday and they released them to the media today. We're getting them as the United States Attorney's Office is able to provide them. So there's a picture of Jane Doe number four inside what is called the mirror room. This was a room inside that mansion where the defendant lived, where he had all of these guests. And why this picture is important is because she's taking a photo of herself. There's a mirror. She's laying on a bed. But the defense used it in their cross-examination of Geronda Pace because they not only wanted to show uh, more about this mirror room, the fact that it had a bathroom, even though she testified that she wasn't able to use that bathroom unless she got permission from the defendant, but also the clothes that she's wearing in that picture, that they were very tight fitting, even though one of the rules was that she couldn't wear uh, tight clothes. She had to wear baggy clothing so that uh, she wouldn't be in any way attracting other men. And that this was one of the strict rules from the defendant. Those rules have been front and center with this employee who's been on the stand today, Anthony Navarro, talking about what he understood those rules to be and how he played a role sometimes in having to go and get things for the guests in that home. Yeah, that's a big part of the prosecutor's case. Julia, I know that you've been there three days now, third day of testimony in the case. What is the feel there still in Brooklyn, around the courthouse, outside, inside, still a presence of people? There's still a presence, Chanley. We actually had to ask some of the people here to turn down the music so that we would be able to have this live shot and it wouldn't be interrupted because it's a constant stream of R. Kelly's music that's being played here by people who are supporting him, who say that this is a sham, that the government shouldn't be bringing these charges. I've been hearing chants of unmute R. Kelly in response to the mute R. Kelly movement that happened back in 2019 uh, when there was a push to get his music not played anywhere on the air, on radio. So there is that presence here. It's not a large showing, but I've seen at least a dozen people who have been trying to get inside the courtroom to watch these proceedings on that closed circuit TV. Great, great insights. Thank you, Julia. For those of you watching along, you can follow Julia on Twitter, all of her social media. She updates it all the time about what's happening in the R. Kelly case. Julia Court TV, right? Uh, thank you so much.